Hello, ladies and gentlemen, it's Mike here at Game From Scratch, and I gotta say, the world of AI is really starting to feel a bit like a Rube Goldberg machine, something that exists just for the sake of existing at this point in time. And today we're going to be talking about Muse. Now, this is something that took the internet by storm this week. This is from Microsoft Research. It is a generative AI model designed for gameplay, gameplay ideation. So this is for uh, testing your games to basically use AI to recreate your game, and then you can change things in, and then AI will update and take the changes that you made into effect. Now, there are a couple of major problems with this one, but we're going to go ahead and take a quick look at it. So they've got a new buzz phrase. That is the world human action model. So that's world and human action model wham. Uh, the wham, which we named Muse, is a generative AI model of video games that can generate game visuals, controller actions, or both. So basically, it studies gameplay videos and then basically recreates it. If this sounds at all familiar to you, well, that's because Google have their game engine, uh, which is what they called it, uh, see, game engine, like so. And this was an AI they taught how to play Doom. Now, it's not actually playing Doom. It's recreating it. Uh, and then when you control it, it's guessing how to re-render the world. And in some ways, it's like a fever dream. It absolutely... Um, yeah, it can be an interesting experience. Well, they've done the same thing now at Microsoft. This is Microsoft Research Game Intelligence and Teachable AI Experiences team collaborating with Xbox Studio Ninja Theory. And what they've did is they took seven years of gameplay footage for a Ninja Studio uh, Ninja Studio game, um, and then the input for that game, and then they fed that into an AI, and that AI can now kind of guess how it would render the next frame of that game. And here you can see examples of it in action. Now, what I want to point out here is these are very tiny. Now, one of the reasons is um, it kind of hides some of the slopness. So what we've got here is example gameplay sequences generated by Muse, um, demonstrating that our model can generate complex gameplay sequences that are consistent over several minutes. That was actually one of the problems with the uh, game engine Doom example, is you'd go down a corridor, and then you turn around and come back, and then, like, the say the the material pickup that you did, like the ammo or something, it uh, it would be gone or it would be back. Like, I had no idea of persistence here. This is saying that it's got two minutes of persistence with what they've got. All examples shown here were generated by propping the model with 10 initial frames or one second of human gameplay and controller actions of the whole play sequence. Um, use is used in game, world mode, game model mode, meaning that it is used to predict how the game will evolve from the initial prompt sequence. Uh, the more closely the generated gameplay sequence uh, resembles the actual game, the more accurately Muse has captured the dynamics of that game. So you can see the results here. It's trained at a very, very low resolution, and that low resolution is also hiding some of the slop, by the way. So that's one of the reasons why you are seeing this. A lot of times what you would find uh, is in the other examples, so these, these numbers, it's mimicking. It doesn't really understand what it is updating. It just knows from seeing other people have played the game in the past how to go ahead and update these things. So a lot of times it's just... It's faking the game, basically. So uh, what motivated the research? Basically seeing ChatGPT in action. Um, and then a new research option, uh, opportunity enabled by data. So access to a variety of different data so sources of data. Years they collaborated with Xbox Game Studio Ninja Theory based in Cambridge, UK, just like the research team, to collect data from the game Bleeding Edge. Their 2020 Xbox game, Bleeding Edge is a four versus four game where all players are played, where all games are played online and matches are recorded if the player agrees to the EULA. So that is the big part about it, by the way. If you agree to the EULA of this game, all of your controller inputs have been recorded for the last several years. So that's one of those things they used in it. Um, not only do they have like footage of the game. They also have the inputs that the player did while doing it. So they worked closely with Ninja Theory and the Microsoft Compliance Theory uh, team to make sure that the data was collected ethically, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's been amazing to see the variety of ways Microsoft Research has used bleeding edge environment and data to explore novel techniques in the rapidly moving AI industry. From Hackathon that started it all, uh, where we first integrated AI into bleeding edge to building AI agents that could behave more like human players to the world and human action model, or WAM, um, being able to dream up entirely new sequences of bleeding edge gameplay under human guidance. It's been um, eye-opening to see the potential of this type of data or this type of technology has. Uh, if you're wondering what kind of tech was behind it, they initially trained on a V100 cluster, so we don't know how many V100s there were, uh, but these are uh, several thousand dollars a piece. And then they eventually moved, uh, so training on up to, I guess we do know, up to 100 GPUs. So this is uh, over, you know, I guess that would be a million dollars in 
uh, no, $100,000 or $200,000 worth of chips there. And eventually they moved up to the H100s, which by the way, are about $30,000 a piece. So uh, this isn't something that you're going to be doing in your bedroom at home, uh, at least not with current tech. Um, and you see here is the initial and here is the gameplay. So we're 10,000 updates. So original 10,000 updates. And you're gonna see where it predicted. So you'll see in that first one right there, he goes straight blobs through the wall, has no concept of clipping or anything like that. And then by the 1 million, again, based off of this, it does a better job of predicting the world. Now it is impressive tech because it's going, it's recreating the lighting of a 3D world. It's kind of getting the concept of, um, you know, collisions and 3D world and so on. But again, it is completely and utterly faking it. So you can see the things that it did at this point in time is correct interaction with the power cell and the models flying mechanically correctly. Now do keep in mind, it doesn't really understand the game world. It doesn't understand the idea of stats or boosts or anything. It's emulating, it's faking it completely. And you need a whole lot of hardware to make this happen. So what the hell would you do with any of this? Well, one of the things they talked about was making tools so that they could put things into their gameplay, like uh, a new jump mechanic, and then see how it would actually respond to it. Um, and they want to make it so that it's consistent as possible, doesn't always generate the exact same thing. And again, the persistence, the persistence part is important. If you pick something up and you come back, it should be gone because you picked it up, that kind of thing. So what the hell would you use this for? Well, their big thing is ideation. So the thing is that you would, again, be able to do things like put a boost jump into the world uh, and then it would now identify that that was a change in the world and it would play gameplay differently. So then you could evaluate how your game would work uh, and then use that as a design. But the problem is this thing required several years of training data. So if you're developing a game, you're not going to have that training data. So that use case is odd. Now, the other one we've got, um, so we've got uh, Microsoft chimed in on this and uh, Eurogamer did a good breakdown of why this technology is uh interesting but flawed hey it's great and then we go Just here um one of the things that i get excited about um you know one of the things we care a lot about at xbox is game preservation uh and i think about an opportunity to have models learn about older games games that were maybe tied to unique pieces of hardware where that engine on that hardware is kind of time will erode the amount of hardware that's out there that can actually play a game. But you could imagine a world where from gameplay data um, and video that a model could learn old games and really make them portable to any platform where these models could run. I think that's really exciting. We've talked about game preservation as an act in their ability to learn. So that's the uh, Microsoft use case here. So they could use this to, they could show it to uh, the AI, uh, old footage of an old game, and then you could just use AI training models to compile that game for new platforms. Uh, uh, there are a couple of problems with this. They've got uh, an expert talking about it. Uh, so Michael Cook, Dr. Michael Cook, who is uh, a researcher at a university at King's College of London, a senior lecturer there on AI. And then he talks specifically about their um, game preservation. So lastly, on game preservation, here's what we said with Phil Spencer talking about it in the video. But like Cook calls Spencer's comments idiotic. I mean, in a sense, anything is a preservation tool. I could ask my friend's five-year-old son to draw a Quran picture of what he thinks the ending cutscene of Final Fantasy VIII looks like, and that would still count as game preservation of a certain sort. Despite a decade of AI growth, uh, Cook says there's no method yet to measure what exactly an AI model has captured and what it has not. Muse is able to capture grainy GIFs of one fairly simple video game based on seven years of footage, but is not able to, but it's not a solution for holding everything about a game or every possible outcome of what a player could do. This is absolutely not a solution for game preservation. Uh, what does it mean to preserve a gameplay experience? Even if the model was a perfect replication of the original ex executable software, this is not a be all end all of game preservation. A generative model of what uh, game footage maybe looked like once might be a nice curio on the side of a real preservation process, but it's always going to be inferior to the other ways we approach the problem. And then last month, Take-Two Interactive's boss, Stras Zeltnik, weighed in with his opinion on AI saying, artificial intelligence is an oxymoron. There is no such thing. Now, I think that is overly harsh, but I think for this one, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting technology with no real applicable uses. So uh, the, the two examples they gave were you could spend several hundreds of thousands of dollars having a game 
play an old game and maybe be able to make a somewhat facsimile of it or you could just spend the money on an emulator a whole lot less time and get an actual one-to-one -one recreation of it. So the preservation thing does not make a lot of sense. Um, and the ideation part of it, so where you could do things like add new um, identity or uh, new capabilities into your game and see how AI would respond to them, well, that's wonderful, but your game needs to be fully complete and it has to train on it and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars of training data to get there. So yeah, uh, it's a very cool technology with no applicable use so far as I could tell. It actually, again, game engine from Google, same kind of concept. But if you wanna go ahead and check this out, they have open source the WAM model, some of the training data, etc. So you can go check that out on their Azure servers if you are interested. So ladies and gentlemen, that is Microsoft Muse. Let me know what you think, comments down below. I will talk to you all later, goodbye.